at Ephesians 4 together. We're going to start in verse 11. Let me pray. Father, as we come to a close here of this day, of this time together, we're so thankful for the gifts you've given to the church to serve the church, the number of people who've shared their hearts and their learnings and the wisdom you've granted them. Thank you for the community of faith that we can be in a room like this with like-minded men and women who love Jesus and want to see your fame, Jesus, go to the ends of the earth. We pray that you would grant that we would find ourselves with both the will from you and the, the work that you do through us, empowered by your spirit, Lord. Uh, we want to work out our salvation with fear and trembling because it is you who is at work in us to will and to work. So, Lord, do a good work even in this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. I know I'm probably speaking to the choir, but I'm still going to say it. Um, God has not given certain leaders to the church to do the ministry for the church, but he's given them so that they might equip the church for the work of ministry. And uh, I, wanna, I wanna continue to remind you, those of you especially are given the opportunity to give oversight or direction to a church to not rob the saints of the joy of ministry by doing it for them. Don't, don't take their place, don't, don't try to, to fill the gap with yourself. Uh, God has given you to equip the church for the works of ministry. And those of you who are here who are saying, yeah, man, I'm part of the church. I want to encourage you, be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's, he's called all of us, men and women, to, to be that. I tell our church regularly, your baptism is your commission. You're now commissioned in the ministry. Uh, you don't have to go to Bible school. You don't have to go to seminary. You don't have to have somebody give you some kind of special uh, credit uh, over you. Jesus Christ is the one who affirms you. The Spirit is the one who uh, empowers and anoints you. And ultimately, it's God who sends. Uh, I, I definitely am for leadership in the church, appointing elders and deacons. And I want them to be qualified, so don't mishear me. But I, I do believe that the qualification for a minister of the gospel is regeneration and filling of the Holy Spirit. So like, let's just actually embrace the reality that God wants to fill the world with his presence through his people on his mission. And the reason why they've been given the spirit according to Jesus is that they might be his witnesses, Acts 1.8. So when we've been given the power of the spirit, it's so that we might be able to go out and be Jesus' witnesses to the world. We are called to full-time gospel ministry whether we get paid by a church or not. Uh, what I often say is all of us are full-time gospel ministers, and it's just that God chooses to route his, his funding source through a lot of different mechanisms, be it Dell or where I'm at, Amazon or Microsoft or Boeing. They work for Jesus, and Jesus pays them through those companies by God's grace. So they need to go to work and do their job well, but they're going as a minister of the gospel wherever they go, and it's the job of the church to equip the saints for the works of ministry. Please Keep reminding yourself of that and do not take the place of the gospel ministers God has in your church. Equip them, build them up, pour into them. And those of you who are, who are kind of waiting for that, don't wait. Step into it. Step into who God called you to be in Christ. Step out in faith. Ask the Spirit to empower you and enable you to do the work he saved you for. He didn't just save you from something, he saved you for something. And he, wants to, he saved you for his purposes. So I want to start there, but how do we do it? Let me keep going as we read on. Until we all, if you want to underline, or if you like to circle in your Bible or highlight, make sure you highlight, underline, or circle the word all. Until we all, that's everyone, uh, in the Greek, that means all, just so you know, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood. Now, that word manhood in Ephesians is that, that the, the people of God are supposed to grow up into the fullness of Christ, and the church as a whole is the new humanity on the earth that's supposed to show forth what the new creation reality looks like with Christ as head. That we are no longer under Adam, we're under Christ as head. And as Christ is our head, we together are the new humanity that shows what it looks like to be a part of the new creation. In a sense, what God has started in us, he'll complete. But whatever he's done in us is a foretaste of what will happen when 
all is complete, when the true mature humanity is done, we are a picture of the beginning of that. So in a sense, the church is a foretaste of the future, a sign pointing to what Jesus has, is going to finish in his people. Okay? Now the job then is to build up the people of God to mature manhood, to that new humanity. And the, the measure of it, the way that you know it is the mature one or the mature church is that we're built up into the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, I told you at the beginning session, we're not called to go be Christ, we're called to be filled with Christ so that we might have Christ work in and through us to the world. But we are called to still be imitators of Christ in the sense that we're to grow up into Christ, who is our head, and together as the church, we are to resemble what Christ is like. Now, he does that work in us and through us, so I want to just reiterate what I said earlier, but he does give us a means by which we do grow up. There is a means. Now, it's important to recognize that there is absolutely no room in the Bible for perpetual immaturity. There is no room in the church, according to the Bible, for having a church of people who never grow up. Okay, it's just not there. In fact, look at, what he, look at what he says. So that we may no longer be children. Who's the we? All, right? Us. All of us. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. I often, when I'm speaking to church leaders, uh, in particular, particular, oftentimes lead pastors or visionary leaders, the one who gives a lot of their time to preaching in a church, uh, when I say something like, you know, I really believe the people of God can accomplish the mission of God, uh, in, in everyday life, in their homes, in their neighborhoods, in their workplaces, you know, they, we, they can be entrusted with this. And oftentimes what I'll hear back is, you know, how, aren't you just a little concerned that they're going to pool their ignorance, that, you know, it's just going to be like a bunch of blind leading the blind, or heresy isn't going to just get developed inside of those groups, and they're going to just go off the rails. And, and I, I generally stop and say, okay, hold on, let's just be really clear. The majority of heresy is not happening in the church with the people. It's happening in seminaries with people who are in ivory tower, towers talking and thinking with others like them, disengaged from the mission of everyday disciple making and not generally involved very much in the church's mission to bring the, the gospel of Jesus to the ends of the earth. I'm not worried about people who love Jesus and want to serve Jesus and make disciples of Jesus in the everyday stuff of life, trying to be disciples of disciple make, being disciple making people. I'm not worried about them getting this wrong because what I have found is when you say, Jesus, I want to obey you and I want to obey your word and I want to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth and I want to make much of you in in this clay jar that feels so inadequate to do the work, I've almost never seen heresy come out of that person. I've seen heresy come out of people who pridefully puff themselves up and, and isolate themselves from other people who can hold them accountable in a community of faith that's growing each other up in the gospel. That's usually where heresy starts to find its beginning, is in isolation and in pride, not in community on mission for Jesus' fame. I don't tend to see it there. So those of you in the room, please, can I just give you permission to trust the Spirit of God with your people and the Word of God with your people to be sufficient to equip your people to do the works of ministry and stop worrying about whether it's going to get off the rails and get them on the rail to start with. Just get them out there. Get them out there being God's people on mission in everyday life and make it your goal to trust that the Spirit and the Word is sufficient for God's people to grow up. So that's the first thing. I... Uh, I also want to call you to don't, just don't let yourself settle for anybody staying like a little child in your church. I mean, we want a childlike faith, but we don't want an immature church. Call your people to grow up. What I like to say is the entry bar for mission is really low, and the expectation for discipleship and what they can become is very high. Like, everybody that's born again of the Spirit is in the mission, and everybody should be called to grow up to be mature believers. I had um, an older gentleman join our core group very early on when we started the church in Tacoma. His name is Ray. And um, I remember when I first met with Ray, we were going through the book of John together, and um, we were just getting started. He came to me, and he had been in a church for a long time. He had been a Christian for 40 years. And he came to me, and he said, you're, 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 you're the pastor, right? I said, well, I'm, 
I guess I'm one of the elders here, and he said, well, your job is to feed me. And I'm, I'm like, at this point, I'm 34 years old, and he's probably 58, he's probably 60 at that time. He's been a Christian longer than I have. And uh, I said, you know, your job is to feed me. And, and the first image that came to my mind was my wife and I traveling on a train, uh, Amtrak, across the country from Seattle to Chicago. And you guys ever been on Amtrak? Uh, yeah, I, I won't do it again. But um, <laughs> we were, I got a sleeper car because I'm like, it's going to be, you know, I, 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 already I think it's hard. But if we could sleep, that would be better. So we got the sleeper car and in the middle of the night, like someone's knocking on our door and the train had stopped and they were asking us to get up. And I said, don't wake me up, I'm sleeping. Like I want to sleep through the night. And they said, no, no, you need to get dressed and we're going to get out of the train. You guys ever seen planes, trains, and automobiles? It was that trip. I mean, it was like we had literally, we were in the middle of Montana in the winter in the middle of a field. We had to get our bags and we're walking through the field in the snow with our luggage, my wife and I. And uh, we're, we have to get in this bus. So we get in this bus, and the bus driver, he, sa- he starts this off this way. He says, there ain't anybody that I love more in this world than myself. And I ain't dying tonight, so you're going to be fine. <laughs> That's supposed to give me a lot of comfort, okay? So we're driving through the windy roads of the mountains, you know, and all these things. We finally get to the place where we get out of the next train and we get on the train. And on this train, I'm not in a sleeper car anymore. We're sitting in the normal cabin, you know, with all those folk, you know, the, the you know. And anyway, just kidding. Uh, sorry if that's you. Um, and it was me now. So here we are. Um, we're, we're hanging out and this little boy comes up to his mom and he's probably six years old. And he says, mom, I'm hungry. And I'm thinking, you know, she's going to reach into the bag of snacks and pull out some snacks and give her son some snacks. And she just lifts up her shirt, and that boy just walks up to mama, and he starts drinking. I know some of you are Austin weird, and you're like, yeah, that's normal. (laughs) It's not normal. Okay? If you got teeth, (laughs) you're done. You're done with milk. You don't get to have that until you get married, just so we're clear, okay? Sorry. <laughs> it's in the Bible, okay? Read Song of Solomon, all right? Okay? <laughs> so it's time for meat, right? And so when, when, when Ray says to me, you got to feed me, that's the image that comes to my mind. Right? And I just go, no, no, Ray, it's not my job to feed you. He goes, the Bible says, Jesus said to Peter, feed my sheep. And I said, remember who he was sending him out to. Those were people who didn't know Jesus. Peter's going to go proclaim the gospel so that they'll come to faith and be born again and have a new beginning, a new life. And he's got to grow them up with the pure spiritual milk of the word. And then he's got to teach them how not just to be someone who receives like a little bird someone else's chewings and spit it into their mouth, but rather learns how to feast on the word themselves, chew it up with their spiritual teeth, digest it in such a way into their life that they can bring it out in the form of milk to non-believers and brand new believers. So Ray, you've been a follower of Jesus for an awful long time long time. You've got teeth. Start to chew the word. Start to digest the word. I'm, I'm convinced that you can be fed by the word of God and the spirit of God that the gospel has power to change you. And uh, he had, he, it was interesting. I had asked him, what had you done in your previous church? And he said, I was an usher. I said, how long were you an usher? I think 40 years. <laughs> and I'm going like, you've been a believer for 40 years and all you do is ush. Like, that's not enough, man. Like, there's got to be more for you than this. And I, you look at this passage, and Paul says we're supposed to grow people up. He says to the Colossian church that we're supposed to, we're supposed to present everyone mature in Christ. And maturity is that you're a meat eater. And I love it when people come to me and they say, hey, Jeff, I just love, I love doxa because you give us the meat. And I go, what do you mean? Are you feeding somebody? Like, no, no, like you're teaching. It's so good, man. I'm growing a ton by it. I'm like, oh, you man, I'm giving you milk. So, no, no, meat. You give us the real deep stuff. I'm like, no, that's not meat. Meat is you go home and chew up the word of God and you give it to someone else in the form of milk. I've been giving you milk. It's just really good milk. <laughs> <laughs> 
Because it's the word of God. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm glad that you walk away and you're fed by it. I'm not, I don't have a problem with that. But if you've been a follower of Jesus for a while, you should be able to feed others. And I said to Ray, I said, Ray, you know, I want to let you know, Jesus said, and we were in John, and I said, Jesus said to the woman at the, or to the disciples when they find him with the woman at the well, you remember what they say? Aren't you hungry? And he says, I have food that you know nothing of. My food is to do the will of my Father who sent me. And I said, Ray, if you this week will take God's word, and I'm going to give you a journal and I want to encourage you to start just opening God's word, pray, ask the Spirit to open your heart to what he has to say to you, and then ask him, what do you want me to do in light of what you've said? And if you do what he tells you to do, then I promise you, you'll be better fed than any sermon you ever receive. And I'm not making this up. This is what Jesus says. Our food is to do the will of our Father. And he said, I don't know if I believe that. And I said, well, just try it. Just this week, just read the word, listen to the Spirit, write down what you learn, ask him what he wants you to do, and then do what he tells you to do with his help. Say, Holy Spirit, power me, give me the strength, help me to do it because of love for Christ and all that, and then come back and tell me how well you were fed this week. And he was very skeptical. And he came back the next week And he said, you were right. This was the best week of my life. He said, I read, I learned, I heard from the Spirit, I applied it, I obeyed it. It was amazing, Jeff. You know, Ray went on. It was probably about a month later. He started telling everybody what God was doing in his life through the word word of God, and he started leading guys to Christ. He had this latent evangelist gift. He started leading people to Christ, and all of a sudden, not only was he leading people to Christ, but as he grew in his ability to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to non-believers, he also realized it applied to believers, and he started helping people with addictive problems, and all of a sudden, a group of people realized this guy can help people who are in addiction and are getting out of homelessness, and so they plugged him into the homeless shelter, and he became the gospel-centered counselor in our local center, our almost center downtown Tacoma. And I would hear stories about how many guys he led to Christ. And he had spent 40 years ushing. <laughs> and in about four months, he got to lead a whole bunch of people to Christ. And he came to me, and he's like, that one day, that one moment when you didn't let me get away with being an infant anymore changed me. Can I just encourage you, don't let people settle with something less than what God wants for them. He has such good things in store for us, his kids. He wants us to grow up.